Um, as you said, my name is Rafik Assad. I am the current president of the Wisconsin chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architects. And I am here to introduce Walter Wilson. Um, a little bit about Wisco Noma, as we're affectionately known. Um, we were chartered in um, December of 2019 after a number of years. I moved here in 2013 and um, a, another local architect, Michael Ford and I, we got together and said, we've been NOMA members for a while that we needed a chapter here in Wisconsin um, to support the mission of the national organization. And we tried and tried and we just could not get the numbers. Um, the number of minority architects in the state of Wisconsin is few and far between. Um, so we had an idea that we took from the Illinois chapter to make a state chapter. And so we reached out to people in Milwaukee and we had a list that it was outdated and half the people were dead. And it was just a very um, trying experience. So from 2013 to 2019, we'd worked and worked. And then we found a group of people, Marion, Anina, um, Tessa, Muhammad, um, another, a, a number of people throughout Madison and Milwaukee. And um, we were able to get it done. And so we've um, hit the ground running and I am very proud of the organization and the work that we've been doing. And this past year, we were named small chapter of the year by the national organization and reaching a five-star status. So be on the lookout for some more programming and um, initiatives from Wisconsin Noma. I know we partnered with AIA and doing some diversity and equity things and um, it's just been a, a really good time. So Mr. Wilson, uh, Mr. Wilson is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. He's also the 2022 AIA Wisconsin Golden Award recipient, which is the highest award bestowed upon its members. He holds a double major, a bachelor's of architectural engineering and architectural design from Oklahoma State University. He's the past treasurer of the National Organization of Minority Architects, past Wisconsin chair of the architect section of the Department of Regulation and Licensing for architects, landscapes, architects, engineers, and surveyors. He's the past chair of the National Council of Architecture Registration Boards, NCAR, Region 4. Mr. Wilson is an adjunct professor at UWM School of Architecture and Urban Planning and has taught engineering subjects at Oklahoma State University School of Architecture and ITT Bailey Institute in St. Louis. He served as CEO of the Wilson Firm, Architects and Engineers, and has numerous projects with the city of Milwaukee um, Housing Authority. And Walter, when we formed the Wisco Noma, we reached out to him um, because we said, nobody else should be the first president of Wisconsin Noma. And he graciously accepted and he led us through our first year. And so it is my pleasure to present to you, Walter Wilson, FAIA. Thank you very much, uh, Rafiq. Uh, for that gracious introduction. And thanks uh, to the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, community for inviting me to speak to you this evening. Uh, I'm an admirer of Frank Lloyd Wright uh, and his work. Uh, Wright was uh, the focus of many conversations when I was in an architecture school at Oklahoma State. And being from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Bear Run is right outside uh, Pittsburgh, and I visited uh, uh, the Kaufman House more than once. I've seen it both before it was restored and after it has uh, it, it was restored. So um, thank you again for having me. Um, moving along here. Uh, Design for You was founded after uh, my retirement from Milwaukee County Department of Public Works. Uh, I held the principal arch architect's position there for over 13 years. Um, design for You is a multidisciplinary design firm that focuses on client services for developing, designing, documenting, and delivering a variety of client uh, services. I also produce greeting cards, postcards, and zines, of course, uh, mini magazines under the, uh, the same uh, uh, title, Design for You. Um, uh, uh, 
in the picture there is my my grandmother, my father, and my sister. Here's another picture picture of my sister and I stand, standing across the street from our house apartment building. It's the third one from the from your your uh, right would it be or left? Um, that's where I grew up until uh, age six or seven. Um, these are pictures of my parents. And uh, the photo there is taken at one of our family reunions. The cir cir circle is me. Here's an, another picture of me in uh, grade school sitting outside on the steps of McKelvey School. The circle is me. The yellow arrow there is one of my best friends who is one of, one of the uh, Washington, D.C. lawyers that people like, like to chastise or, or say bad things about. So just to give you some idea of the character of uh, the, school, the grade school and the environment, the environment that I grew up in. Um, I, uh, um, as you can see, uh, um, always had it in my mind that I wanted to be an architect. And then, uh, if we go back there, uh, I can show you what it says. The caption says there. Uh, Walter Wilson track team, basketball team, safety club, ice buildings, he'll erect when he becomes an architect. And sure enough, I made it. In <laughs> uh, the uh, background there is the Shunley High School, which is now on the Registry of Historic Buildings, by the way. Um, Rafiq uh, kind of capsulized my educational background. Uh, I'm a firm believer in lifelong learning. I, I hail from Pittsburgh, but I started my college career at Oklahoma uh, while I was uh, on active duty in the United States Air Force and stationed in Altus, Oklahoma. While in Oklahoma, uh, I received a, uh, several uh, scholarships to play basketball. Uh, uh, I accepted one at the University of Central Oklahoma. Uh, after my honorable discharge from the United States Air Force and later transferred to Oklahoma State University, where I continued my academic requirements for architecture and structural engineering, I graduated as the only African-American uh, in both academic programs at Oklahoma State and only the second one from the architecture program and the first one from the structural engineering program. While I was there, and this is in the 60s, right after um, uh, the, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, God, I've lost for words here, but right, at, right, right after integration uh, took place in the 60s. Um, my professional ex uh, experience, uh, I held uh, internships at Frankfurt Short, Emory McKinley in Oklahoma City, and uh, Trot and Bean Associates in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I spent a, a long uh, period of time, nine years at Southwich and Bell Telephone Company, where I worked in Missouri, Texas, and Arkansas. After receiving my uh, my architect's license, I partnered with uh, Wally Carradine uh, to form Carradine and Wilson Associates in Arkansas. When I when Wally and I received the threats from a, a white developer in Arkansas, I decided to leave Arkansas as fast as I could. Wally and I uh, separated on on good terms. Uh, I accepted a position with the uh, with Polytech uh, uh, Incorporated Engineering and Architects, and moved to Wisconsin. Having Wisconsin, having the bug to run on my own, uh, run in my own business, I hung out uh, on my shingle as the Wilson firm 
1985. It was not as easy as I thought it would be. And my finances were not the greatest either. So I accepted a managing position uh, at the city of Milwaukee in the, the uh, department of, uh, uh, in the housing authority. Uh, leaving the city, uh, three years later, I reimagined the Wilson firm, uh, calling it the Wilson firm A&E Limited. Uh, and I uh, stayed in business until 2001. Uh, and I had, re had a heart attack in late 2000. And uh, uh, under the stress and so on, I, it was wise for me to just sell out, which I did. Uh, and took a, and accepted a position with... Um, Milwaukee uh, Department of uh, Milwaukee County Department of uh, Public Works. Um, architecture, uh, architectural practice via client in, uh, engagement is a, a philosophy of mine. Uh, where professionalism and competence is key. Clear-minded approach to problem solving is important. Accepting criticism and alternative points of view and embracing positive change and maintaining a positive outlook is very important to me. Albert Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge for knowledge is limited to all we know and understand while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to be known and understood. Um, I think that um, my accomplishments have already been spoken of, so I won't dwell on those. But these are just some of the things that uh, uh, I have achieved over the years that I've been here in Milwaukee. Um, I wanted to make a connection between uh, my journey to find um, place uh and and place making as it relates to architecture and how it's influenced my journey through architecture as a career uh, public spaces uh share the following qualities they're accessible uh they are uh, places where people engage in activities and the space is uh, often very comfortable and has a good image. And it's also a place that's very sociable where, where people come together and meet and gather. I've always been fascinated with place in reference to the neighborhood and the community where I grew up in and where my closest relatives lived and grew up too. And one of my aspirations early on was to some uh, someday go back to Pittsburgh as an architect and change some of the uh, and and have a positive um, participation in changing the neighborhoods and the communities that I was most familiar with uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, what what makes a great place in the first place? Um, we, we have ideas of what uh, uh, the ingredients of great spaces entail. Great public spaces are those places where celebrations are held, social and economic exchanges occur, friends run into each other, and cultures mix. They are the front porch, porches of our public institutions, like libraries, field houses, schools, 
where we interact with each other and, and also in government, where we govern. When these spaces work well, they serve us and they, they serve as a stage for our public lives. And so sociability, uses of activities, access to linkages and comfort and image are all the things are the, the initial ingredients that make for great spaces. I believe uh, we, well, one of the things that, uh, that, that we do is we develop matrix to help us understand the life cycle of families when designing residential buildings and facilities. We make predictions on how long it will take to, uh, for married couples, for example, to move into a residence, begin having children, watch them mature, and then watch them leave one by one and uh, to the, uh, the stage where the couples are alone again. I know of no matrix, however, that anticipates the life cycle of a place like a park or a neighborhood business district or even a public space. Um, so imagine if our public spaces supported public transportation as a primary mode of everyday travel in our cities. Imagine if the station or the transit stop where you board your bus or train every day was also where you shopped, uh, ran errands, greeted your neighbors, accepted retail, ex access retail, bought food, accessed public services, or did other activities that are an integral part of your daily life. Imagine a station, a stop, as a place where you gather to celebrate your communities or even uh, the uh, envision uh, and co-create its or, or, or to create their, its future. So a public place, uh, a, a place led future is one where the public um, space projects and uh, and the government structures that produce them tend to fall into one of four types of development along a spectrum. First uh, of those four is a project driven or project driven spaces uh, that often emerge from top down bureau bureaucratic leadership, which value on time, under budget delivery above all else. Project driven processes generally lead to places that follow a general protocol without any consideration for local needs or, or desires. Second would be discipline-led projects that may be high, of a higher value or more uh, proto photogenic, but uh, their reliance on the singular vision or design professionals and other disciplinary solos, silos often uh, make the spaces that they uh, that do not function terribly well as public gathering spaces. The third is the place sensitive approach to projects which we see emerging among some design professionals, which makes a concerted effort to gather community input, but the process is still led by designers and architects. And lastly, a truly place-led approach relies not on community input, but on a unified focus of places, uh, place uh, outcomes built on community engagement. A place-led uh, process turns proximity into purpose and the planning and management of shared public spaces into a group activity that builds social capital and shares values. Local participants in this process feel invested in the resulting public space and are more likely to serve as its stewards. Cities need destinations. 
they give identity and image to their communities. Um, they also help new residents, businesses, and investments occur. They create strong community destinations. They attract people and destinations to a downtown, to a main street, a waterfront, a park, or a museum. Uh, I, I like to think of uh, a, uh, a destination as uh, one of 10 other places that you could go to. So, and I, I call it the, the rule of 10. So a stop in one place will allow you to go to nine other places as connectors uh, to make uh, a place and a space uh, more uh, uh, civilized, more social, uh, more community oriented and so on. Remember I showed you the apartment where I grew up in, in Pittsburgh on Bedford Avenue. Well, the third house down from the corner there is where my old apartment uh, where I was born used to be. And that's a character Bedford Avenue today. You can see how it's drastically changed. Uh, uh, the, the texture and the, uh, and the character of this, of the whole neighborhood has changed. No, there's no streetcar tracks on the street, no cobblestones on the street. Um, down the street used to be a barber shop and a grocery store and a coffee shop and a bakery. Toward town, downtown was a place called uh, Hill City where the community used to gather for meetings and also for after school activities. It's no longer there either. Um, now, fast forward to um, my relocation to uh, Wisconsin. The, there are two buildings that were my first assignments upon arriving to Milwaukee in August of 1982, when I was empl employed by Polytech Engineers Incorporated. It was the Hillside Fleet Maintenance Facility, a 550,000 square foot uh, maintenance facility. Uh, it was, um, the facility is designed and equipped to build a new uh, bus from start to, to finish. At the time it was built, it was a state-of-the-art facility. A, as a matter of fact, a portrait of me hangs or hung in the studio, the headquarters building there for many decades uh, after at the completion of that project. This is a re um, rendering that was done by uh, Traveris and Associates, who was this, the associate architecture firm with Polytech on this project. And um, the, that, uh, it shows the front of it. Here's the uh, the headquarters building here. Uh, the uh, and um, here's a view, uh, an aerial view of the facility where we have um, the fleet maintenance building on your left, and on the right is the headquarters building, which. Uh, the view you 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 saw earlier. Um, this is uh, is an example of the kind of work that the Wilson firm did in the early days of its existence. When talking about place making, a consistent reality um, will resonate from any conversation about the making of great places in our towns and cities. One is that great places must be maintained by supportive but often overlooked infrastructure. The telephone buildings are one of the many examples of types of infrastructure necessary to support great places. 
once they are conceived and constructed. Unknowingly, that was the, the direction of the architecture that I was practicing, architecture that was necessary to support places. The telephone equipment spaces uh, were converted into office spaces in response to the miniaturization of, of uh, switching and communications equipment and infrastructure. By architecture practice uh, thrive, my architecture practice thrived upon converting Wisconsin Bell equipment buildings in Dow buildings uh, into office spaces. The remodeling and renovation of telephone buildings created places for people to work in old machine spaces. I was good at it, I did it for nine years. Um, this is um, this is a view from the uh, the uh, cafeteria that uh, I designed. Um, I'm the photographer, so the pictures aren't the greatest. Uh, later on, I uh, I realized the beauty of having a professional photographer, but at the time, um, I either couldn't afford it or, or wasn't uh, uh, in a position to get one. Uh, here's a view looking south from the parking uh, and, and parking lot and driveway. The site is encapsulated by a wooded area that provided a scenic view from the new cafeteria that I created uh, with the building addition. Uh, one of the things I used to do wherever I had an opportunity was try to uh, not make a building addition look like a building addition especially when uh, the architecture itself was was not uh, offensive. And in, in this case, uh, it worked out very well for us. Note these are very small projects though, and that's what it was like in the beginning. I uh, had remarked to somebody, well, I wasn't making any money, but I was having a lot of fun doing some really interesting work. Um, one thing not talked about is the life cycle of neighborhoods like this one. And uh, the Emmaus Lutheran School and Child uh, Care Facility was meant uh, to reinvigorate the old urban landscape, the neighborhood pride, and the resident sense of community. Uh, the owners made it clear that they uh, were committed to making long-term investments in their school, their church, and the daycare program to enhance and beautify their neighborhood image. Uh, the building was uh, two stories in a basement. And um, you, we can see, I don't know if I can show on there or not, uh, it had a tunnel that led to across an alley into the church and then back up again. And that's what that this area over here shows where that uh, underground corridor went to connect the church to the daycare facility. Um, one of the important things that uh, we tried to do is make sure that the building was contextual. So when you look at the daycare center, it fits very neatly into the character of the rest of the neighborhood. And like it was supposed to, supposed to be there from the very beginning uh, uh, of the development of the neighborhood. Um, another interesting thing is one of the members of the church was, a, was an artist, muralist. And uh, on the upper floor there, she literally painted this beautiful scene across the ceiling. That's it's unfortunate that I don't have pictures. It was it was really that great. Uh, this is a north elevation of the daycare facility. The choice of materials allow us to provide a contextual feeling to the building 
allowing it to be to blend into the surrounding neighborhood. The idea being to make the facility welcoming and accessible to families in the community, whether or not they were members of the Emmaus Evangelical Church. We have no metric to determine the timetable uh, for the deterioration of neighborhoods, unfortunately. Nor are we good at predicting which projects will survive the test of time and which ones will not. The massive evangelical church had the noble aspiration of serving the community in which it was located, even though the character and the dominant ethnicity of the surrounding neighborhoods changed from predominantly German and white to black and people of color. This place was a magnet of the community for years, but slowly the community was overcome by uh, the deleterious and social forces. The life cycle of the architecture turns out to be an unwitting emblem of an urban landscape subjected to negative, uh, to a uh, subjected to neg uh, neglect and despair. This is what happened. Those circles there in the show uh, and uh, locations where homes were demolished and uh, they're now lay vacant. The neighborhood was changed. The aerial view of the neighborhood reveals how the catchment area of the mass evangelical church uh, was transformed over a period of years by a changed demographic. We can see where homes were demolished, leaving behind vacant lots. Other residents in the area are boarded up. The fate of Emmaus Evangelical Church and its school and its daycare buildings are emblematic of that change. The Waukesha transit system uh, utility needed to explain, needed to um, expand uh, its facilities to meet growing public uh, demands for transportation. Uh, the Waukesha Metro Transit Operations and Maintenance Facility is located on uh, Badger Drive in Waukesha, Wisconsin. The original building was constructed in 1985 and comprised approximately 16,000 square feet, including a vehicle maintenance shop, two maintenance bays, an office bus storage lane, one wash service lane, two parts storage uh, rooms, two uh, locker rooms, administrative office space. Uh, but the new building addition adds another 13,000 square feet to the building and it was completed in 1985 by the Wilson firm. The building has become a landmark for this Waukesha neighborhood. You can see here um, the various um, departments in the building from ad administrative space all the way through to mezzanine storage and so on. That was before, this is after. Uh, this is the, the bus storage bay. Uh, the Waukesha Metro Transit Operations and Maintenance Building is located on Badger Drive. The shape of the building addition took on the curve of the street where the building fronts. This resulted in a building facade that, uh, that softened the character of an industrial type of building and gave the building a unique identity that makes it a landmark 
in the Waukesha neighborhood. I, I'd like to add that um, over these years, that building has remained uh, uh, viable and is untouched by the economic uh, traumas that uh, occurred where um, the Emmaus uh, Child Care Center is located. So we we have these juxtaposition of, of spaces uh, over time that have been affected by time in different ways. Uh, here again, um, the the transit facility is and plays a support role uh, with regard to how we identify great places and spaces. This is a combat readiness training facility, which was needed to expand, needed to be expanded uh, uh, for its operational mission uh, at the Air National Guard. Um, the building satisfies three distinct functions, functional groups. One is administration, two is training, and the other is uh, maintenance of uh, maintenance. Uh, there um, also was a distinct uh, requirement for the site. Um, here uh, we have a site plan showing uh, how the building was laid out into three distinct uh, parts. Uh, we have the public face, we have the operation space, and then we have the module maintenance space on the on the end. We also uh, provided new landscaping uh, that uh, served up, uh, a more pedestrian access to and through the site. Here, uh, we uh, have uh, more clearly defined the, the various departments in the building. What's interesting about this building is top secret uh, if, um, activities occur in the same building where public is invited uh, to visit the building. So um, that, that's an interesting aspect of, of this particular design. Here's a, a photograph of the front. That may be one picture that I took. We had some other ones, but basically um, it um, almost, it works, serves almost like a bubble diagram in the sense that each of the functions are very distinct, whether you're inside the building or outside. Here's an interior view looking down the main corridor. Uh, more or less I, defining the access that you saw outside of the building going all the way through. And the top secret sides is one side and the public sides on the other. We uh, actually won a national design award for that project, by the way. Um, this project was born out of a need for the owner to expand local convenient and low cost medical services to the inner city residents who were not receiving adequate health and care before uh, they either had um, no medical insurance or were either or uninsured. Uh, this uh, 26,000 square foot in-house dental facility, gyne gynecology, alcoholic and drug abuse counseling, pediatric care, family medicine, pharmacy, x-ray, and minor surgery services are all packed into this one building. We often like to talk about uh, building efficiencies, and we, we uh, associate a quality of building with building efficiency, so that the lower the efficiency, the better, the higher quality of the building. This particular building has a very 
very high building efficiency uh, to serve a public uh, that was um, driven by a very low uh, budget and a very high need to pack a lot of services into one, sp one space. And we did that uh, very successfully here. Um, these are some of the view of some of the spaces in the uh, in the in the project, um, and um, it was born out of the need for the owner to expand those uh, those services. Um, years later, um, uh, the Healthcare center had an opportunity to expand. And um, so at the time I was a county architect. And so I uh, contacted a friend of mine, another African-American architect in Chicago, Smith and Smith. And I handed all of my documents over to them and uh, they used those to add on this uh, northernmost uh, addition to that same building. And you can see the character uh, of the building uh, and the addition that he put on blends in perfectly. Uh, this is a um, shows the site, the way uh, we were able to configure it around the building. It's a zero lot line uh, building as a mandate for uh, new urbanism, which uh, Mayor Norquist pushed very heavily at the time. Uh, so we satisfied uh, the requirements for a zero lot line. We also uh, completed the program as the uh, client asked for it. And uh, we were able to squeeze that all onto one lot. This shows some of the floor plans on one on the first floor that we were able to pack into this building. Uh, the primary building material, of course, uh, uh, in our solution was was brick masonry, and it was because uh, it was more contextual. A very high building efficiency ratio was necessary because of construction funds were limited while the program requirements were extensive. It was also necessary to accommodate some drive up uh, emergency patients. Therefore, parking facilities were provided in the rear of the building uh, with a drop off location on the south side of the building, which also served as a front entry. I think I'll go back to that. The building was designed so that it will give patients and guests a sense of relief and security when entering. Large glazed areas at the northern and southern ends of the building break up the building facade on Dr. Martin Luther King Drive. The concave glazing on the southern end of the building clearly identifies the entrance to the building. The southern uh, exposure allows waiting patients and guests to be exposed to the therapeutic effects of daylighting. The same exposure adds a sense of drama and importance. to The conference room on the second floor where the board and medical uh, practitioners uh, hold their meetings. Um, this is this site where we we noticed um, the place is also going through the same kind of changes as was occurring over at a Emmaus uh, Church. However, uh, the business district there on Martin Luther King Drive have been fighting back, and some of these vacant lots uh, may one day be uh, filled again and bring uh, uh, the, the texture uh, of the community back to, together the way it was before. 
Uh, I might add also that um, our urban renewal or the period uh, in our recent history where uh, there is uh, the, the, there was a move to um, break up neighborhoods, especially in, in minority communities through urban renewal and, and transportation projects like highways, um, where they had a deleterious effect in those days, we're still trying to come up with ways to solve those problems, even to the point where we're uh, talking about um, bringing, re-knitting the, the fabric of these broken communities back together. And that effort is, I think, uh, the the uh, Martin Luther King Health, Heritage Healthcare Center was uh, one of many, is one of many attempts to re-knit uh, knit the, the fabric of the area back. And to uh, uh, better redefine that, that place where there are, where uh, the community can come together. Um, this is a project that uh, we completed um, uh, the design and uh, for, uh, for the city of Milwaukee. And it's a 30,000 square foot municipal refuse transfer facility. Um, we did this project uh, with HNDB at the time, but it's an example of another um, type of architectural facility that uh, is intended to support great places. And uh, uh, they're, um, these transfer uh, buildings are are critical to moving refuse <laughs> uh, from our cities and and making them clean and, and habitable. Um, the building, this particular building, has uh, eleven unloading bays for incoming trucks uh, to dump. Uh, uh, and inside the building is a huge compactor which literally squeezes um, product that's delivered and compacts it before it's uh, uh, transported out of the city. Um, here's another look at it. And here's an aerial view of, of that building. Here again, that that building has not been uh, affected by e economics, uh, social uh, uprest, uh, unrest, or any of the other impacts that occurred at uh, Emmaus Church. Uh, this is a project that uh, went under construction, by the way. This is a SDC food service facility, went under construction. Uh, and because of uh, a political upheaval and uh, was uh, discontinued, the construction was actually stopped. Uh, and the structure that was going in place was actually removed. Um, And that's something that um, we did not anticipate. And it's not in any kind of matri uh, metrics for determ determining the sex success of architecture, architectural project. This is a Milwaukee Public Museum. It was a renovation project. Uh, the Wilson firm uh, uh, was given this segment of the renovation and remodeling of the Milwaukee Public Museum. And uh, here again, this is a project that identifies place where people uh, come uh, to uh, the museum to understand both present and past history. 
And it's also a place where people gather to uh, for lunch or for um, for conversation, as well as other uh, public programs. So this is some of the work that uh, we did to to um, for that renovation project. Um, I might I might add that the uh, the gift shops there are two gift shops in there. We not only did design the gift shop, but we designed all of the furniture in it. All the cabinets and tree and everything was designed by us, and it was and it was built by the carpentry and cabinet the department of the city of Milwaukee. It's one of these unusual cases where we designed it and had it all built by the city, by the uh, by the uh, the county. Um, this is a uh, the 35th Street training facility. Um, this is an example. Pro this project promotes immersive learning. This is an example of immersive learning uh, as a paradigm. Uh, the building was uh, repurposed to enable single household uh, women with children to learn a very high paying trade of high voltage electric power maintenance uh, work. And um, we took an old transformer building, uh, gutted it in the places that we needed and, and designed new classroom spaces within them. And then the outside in the back of the building, we cleared a space that allows uh, the women to raise power poles and climb up on them, learn how to wire them up, and then take them down. Um, I will show you what how we designed the classrooms. Uh, this example of immersive learning uh, as a paradigm shows um, that immersive learning is a teaching and, and learning approach that integrates technology with traditional methods of education, providing a more realistic and stimulating environment for growth. It focuses more on the experience of learning rather than if the students answers the right or wrong que uh, question in a classroom. So um, any time of year, uh, the students can go into the classroom and actually um, be immersed in the environment that they'll be working with out in the field. And in this case, the, they're down at a level that uh, they can work at rather than being high up in the air. Um this women's training facility was repurp repurposed. And I do not know the reason why the training facility was closed at this location. It is now a vehicle impoundment facility adorned with, uh, uh, adorned with no trespassing signs and help wanted posters. The area has lost its original character and its vibrancy. Here again, we have no metric to determine when those things are going to occur. And this is an example, another example of our great architecture repurposed for, uh, uh, I guess it's still benign, but uh, an activity that we definitely did not anticipate. Uh, abandoned single, uh, double, and multifamily homes blighted neighborhoods surrounding Marquette University campus. The university led a movement to improve the character of their residential neighborhoods by restoring and rehabilitating board ups and rundown residential buildings in that area. This is just one of a couple dozen buildings that I worked on to restore. Um, some were even worse than this. 
Um, and you can see how we literally redesigned the exteriors and uh, actually had some of them furnished on the inside. Um, this uh, 1909 building complex is listed on the Registry of Historic Buildings. It includes uh, Italianate, uh, the Italianate Newmacher building, uh, the Cream City Brick Victorian uh, Meineke building, uh, Meineke Toy Company building. Uh, the, the collection of these buildings is called, uh, is called the Fine Arts Building and the Chicago factory style manufacturer's home building. Uh, I'm the architect of record on this project. And um, it is still here. Uh, we talk about placemaking and, uh, and great spaces. Here's, here's a, a good example of a place where people congregate, even um, people on uh, on their boats will dock there and walk up Mason Street to partake in the restaurant life there and and so, uh, some of the scenery on on uh, uh, Water Street. Um, my firm was also involved with designing the lighting on uh, on that river walkway as well. Um, the former toy factory manufacturer's home renovation is what we see here. Renamed City Hall Square is a restored brick commercial building. Here, the, the developer Stonehouse Development Incorporated engaged us to assist in reconfiguring huge open factory bays into spacious condo units located adjacent to, uh, to Milwaukee's pedestrian riverfront pathway. Uh, my firm served as the field administrator and architect of record on this significant project that led to the revitalization of, of Milwaukee's central business district. In the beginning, uh, I was hired to prepare uh, record drawings of the nearly vacant manufacturer's home building. Um, as uh, the percentage, my as a percentage minority. Uh, involvement contract. However, uh, the developer was impressed with the work we were doing. Uh, and um, so he found value in uh, uh, keeping us onto the project. And we actually got involved with designing some of the units inside as well. Um, this is a great space. In that uh, it's a very, uh, it's a long pedestrian walkway. Uh, in the summertime, it's it's beautiful and scenic, and there are a lot and lots of people uh, convene on in this area. This um, brick masonry building was was uh, fire damaged and boarded up. Uh, this three-story apartment building was chosen by the YWCA management and its development partners to be restored to provide needed affordable housing for single low-income women and their children. The building is located close to Marquette University campus Milwaukee County Public Transit, uh, Transportation, Family Medical Services, Social Services, and Neighborhood gross, Grocery and Retail Stores. I and my staff provided architectural design and technical assistance to remodel and rehabilitate this building. The new work included converting an, uh, uh, converting an existing swimming pool room into a community room remodeling kitchens, bathrooms, replacing the entire uh, existing roof and roof structure and designing an entirely new facade. 
these are pictures that are I took during construction. You can see how badly it's messed up. Um, this is what the building looks like today. And unlike uh, Emmaus Church, it's still holding up uh, very well. Here again, there's no matrix to determine what will what will last and what will not. Um, this uh, building is um, the uh, Department of Revenue building. It's over on Rimrock, not far from here. Um, the owner is um, uh, the a Alexander Company, but it's uh, the actual revenue building for Wisconsin. Um, my firm teamed up with Urban Resources uh, uh, in collaboration to design and build uh, this project for the Department of Revenue. And uh, I provided architectural design and technical consulting services during the design and development stages of this project. I'm also the architect of record, by the way. Um, this was a $30 million, $31 million construction project. project. Uh, Vendorf was the contractor. Um, here is one of uh, several green roof projects that I did as uh, the county architect for Milwaukee County. Um, this one is on top of the Milwaukee Public Museum. Um, I did, did several others, one over at the Mitchell Park uh, and some other locations as well. Um, I started an initiative to green Mil Mil Milwaukee County buildings. Um, another pr uh, project that I did was putting PV panels on the face of the the Milwaukee Public Museum photovoltaic panels. Uh, that that project was um, handled by HGA for us. This is uh, my residence. As a matter of fact, it's a solar, super insulated house design. We have a thick wall and solar panels on the roof. Uh, it was my uh, attempt at, at um, 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 to save energy and and use um, materials that were more um, uh, sympathetic to our environment and so on. It's an outside picture. You here you can see the panels. We got uh, a little over seven kW. Um, my wife brags about our lowest bill being around 35 bucks in the middle of winter. <laughs> so uh, some pictures inside. Um, th uh, this is the end and the beginning of Design for You. Uh, Something that's on my plate right now is a new educational greenhouse uh, on the school grounds at uh, Wingo School. School. It'd be another opportunity to have design something that is uh, immersive in terms of educational programs, and that the kids actually uh, have an opportunity to step into a greenhouse to study horticulture and have it uh, exposed to the community. So the community outside actually witnesses the kids going through their, their regimen, learning uh, horticulture uh, at the same time. Um, 
Any questions and answers? I can handle them right now. Yes. It's just a compliment. A lot of your designs at the front have got that curved corner. It seems to be kind of like on the transit facility. A lot of your buildings. Though. A lot of the buildings. Yeah, that's kind of cool. That the curved that one corner. Entryway. Yes, yes. That uh, it is meant to respond to um, the pedestrian um, movement as well as a couple of it, well, those buildings are in every case was on the south side of the building. It allows us to uh, get natural light into the building very easily. And you can regulate that with um, uh, shading or whatever, but uh, it also brings in additional heat in the wintertime. In the wintertime, the, the sun tends to be at a lower level and shine in which helps uh, regulate your in, interior environments. In the summer, the sun is more high in the sky and uh, not as much uh, radiant heat go, goes into the building at, at the same time, providing nice daylight to lower your electric bills and your, and your de demand for lumens. In the old days we call it foot candles, now new days we call it lumens. lumens. Walter, I've got one from a Zoom viewer. Okay. And the question is, what would be your ideal project? What would be my ideal project? That's, that's a good question because uh, I've spent so much time in my life in the gym, believe it or not. Uh, when I wasn't in the gym, the only time I wasn't in the gym was when I was in the classroom. And I thought that somehow or other I'd get connected to athletic facilities, which um, almost never happened. I I did a gym for the uh, the, the the Department of uh, Corrections, a, a girls' gym uh, outside of Racine. That was and um, I it was emotional for me uh, because. Um, as an athlete, I have this preconceived notion about what a gym should be, and it was something I couldn't do, even though I tried. I, it was it was a very emotional, but uh, I I would love to do athletic facilities because I spent so much time in them. Uh, the other thing was my aspiration was you, you'll notice in the early pictures there it said. Great buildings, uh, Walter Willie wrecked when he becomes an architect. My aspiration was to go back to Pittsburgh and do housing. And as a matter of fact, my thesis, which I moved, I literally moved off the campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma, to Oklahoma City. I lived in an apartment building uh, and got some... Uh, free office space from the YMCA in Oklahoma City, where I conducted interviews. Uh, I blocked out a neighborhood in Oklahoma City, a black neighborhood in Oklahoma City, and passed out flyers to, I don't know, maybe 50 homes door to door. And I interviewed them. I interviewed them at the Y. And the purpose was to get a real life understanding of how people like me some of whom were low income, how they perceived their lifestyle, what what uh, their taste and in, in, their way of living, their lifestyle, and so uh, would be articulated in space. So uh, I I thought that I would go back and do a lot of housing. And at first at Trot and Venus, so, so I was doing working on some uh, condos, but they were high end, very, very expensive materials and so on, and which was uh, different from what I expected. 
So the housing and the athletics are two things that I thought I would get around to doing and never did. Hey, Walter, uh, thanks so much for the presentation and thanks so much for your body of work and your wonderful work you've done with the AIA. As someone in your last answer, you just indicated your, your level of caring. We saw a window into that and we see that at the AIA all the time. We really appreciate it. So that, that sounds like an incredibly important uh, thing you just talked about, which was in interviewing people about what they expected of their houses and how they felt about their houses. Um, something like that, if we could continue at the AA, would be terrific. But something you are doing uh, with NOMA is reaching out in public schools and making sure that all the students know about uh, careers in architecture and engineering and other careers that are available to them. Can you talk a little bit about that? And thanks so much for this. Sure. Let me, let me hit that uh, and answer you in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, the first way will be as a black architect. Uh, my my parents, my mother and my father, were heavy in, into education as a vehicle for getting out of uh, the Hill District of Pittsburgh, which uh, on, used to be notorious. The Hill District of Pittsburgh is like the Bowery in New York, you know, really, uh, in some cases, a dangerous place if you weren't, weren't from there. Um, and my parents always said uh, to me, uh, you have to be two or three times as smart, two or three times as good as a, as a white person in order to be perceived as average. Uh, and my uncle, who was in construction, told me I would be, I would, I was a fool for trying to pursue architecture as a career because it was a white man's career field. And even white men struggled at it. Um, I, my, my modus operandi was to follow, follow uh, the advice of my parents, ignore my uncle, and, and, and also to prove that architecture is for everybody, not just the white guys. And I say to young kids, follow your dream and your heart. And don't, uh, don't always listen to foolish people who tell you stupid things. Um, so that's, that's my answer. My, the second response is, um, I was the first black architect to, to graduate from the architectural engineering program at Oklahoma State, only the second in the architecture program. At the time I was there in the 60s, you know, we were still having rights street. I was still in college when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And yet, out of all of that, um, I graduated. I was not the highest nor the lowest in my class, but I got the Alpha Rho Chi Award. I don't think there's been another African American since who has been so honored. Uh, I'd like to think that someday there'll be a, maybe a dozen after me who achieved that level uh, at Oklahoma State or some of the other universities that have that program that you can. Um, the other thing is that um, I, I relish being a mentor as opposed to not wanting to do that uh, because God only knows what it would have been like for me to be in Wisconsin had Alonzo Robinson not here 
not been here before me to bear, to break open paths that I probably would never have been able to, able to walk into. Um, so, and I, 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 I welcome uh, the opportunity to be uh, uh, a sounding board for any kid, black or white, purple, green, pur polka dot, whatever, who wants to go into architecture because it's an extremely um, rewarding uh, career field. Um, uh, that's just to answer your question. Walter? I yes. have one from the booth back here from another Zoom viewer. Okay. You had talked earlier in the presentation about the metrics for predicting the life cycle of a building. Yes. And the question is, what would you include as variables for metrics for predicting the life cycle of a building? Uh, that's a... Very difficult question because there's not just one variable. I think it's a number of variables. Uh, I, with my math background, you know, in an equations, you have, you know, if you have three unknowns, you need to know two of the three in order to solve the third. Uh, if there are 20 unknowns, you still need to know 19 of the uh, un, un, uh, unknowns before you can know. I mean, you need to know, have 20 knowns before you can decide what the unknown is. And we often use, um, what do they call them, constants to, to take the place of some of the un, some of the things that are unknown that need to be known. We do that in structures, in, in structural engineering, when uh, we have um, the, the equations are indeterminate. So we, we iterate through these constants to get to a, a value that we can use, feel comfortable with for structures. So uh, in answer of your question, uh, I don't know. Uh, we need to think about that. Um, and I, I, in that, in that regard, my daughter is uh, get, getting her PhD in geography. And um, in geography, you accumulate uh, data. You take a, a, a body of data, and out of that, you extrapolate. Uh, uh, variables and uh, things that are alike and use that uh, to make a prediction. And I think that that would be a, a great uh, opportunity for some PhD person to just try to explore. But uh, that being said, uh, we have some uh, anec anecdotal uh, things that we can refer to with regard to um, how existing buildings to date have performed and what context they're in to make a, you know, a, an educated guess about what those factors might be. I think um, developers do that because they always wanna make money, uh, which probably is one of the reasons why communities tend to be gentrified uh, rather than uh, going after projects where their opportunity for success are more uh, sketchy. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Hey, Walter. Mm -hmm. the next question? Yeah, over here. Oh, okay. Uh, first, thanks for sharing your work and um, a little bit of your life story. Um, in addition to your work in private practice, you had a pretty long career in the public sector as well. Um, you shared a little bit there with the green roofs. 
Uh, what I'm wondering is, I'm, assume, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, but during that public part of your career, I'm sure you had a lot of influence on projects as both client or uh, just as, as overseen in that role uh, with the city, with the county. Um, if that is a true, I guess the question I'm wondering is, do you feel um, in the context of the placemaking that was talked about and what you strive to do within your own work, do you feel you had greater influence as in the public sector or in the private sector in terms of the um, place making it and the influencing of your community and lasting improvements to the community? That's a, that's, that's a great question. That's an excellent question. Because um, as in my tenure as a county architect, for Milwaukee De County Department of Public Works. Um, my aspirations as far as the, the facilities of the county and so on um, were, um, they, they, that was one thing. Uh, there's, a, there's the politics that's on the other end of it. And I wanted to do a lot of things for to enhance uh, the infrastructure, the facilities, and so on at Milwaukee County, but they were they all had to go through a review through um, the uh, county supervisors. Uh, some even had to have uh, public scrutiny. I can give you some examples. Uh, one that's being discussed even now, and that would be Mitchell Domes at Mitchell Park, where I did, I literally did uh, an economic study on uh, the Mitchell Domes for the county. It was reviewed by the Board of Supervisors and then tabled. Uh, now it's up on, uh, under discussion now, I think they want to knock it down or either uh, some have said, others have said, replace it with something that looks like it. I don't know where the, the discussion is right now, but um, I actually met the architect who designed the building. He came to me personally and gave me his portfolio with his patents and everything in it, which I turned, you know, I, I thought to myself, why am I holding on to this? I I gave it to the the city. It's in the in uh, in the A and E department now, the the county. But um, I think that the that the dome should be on the registry of historic buildings. And um, quite as it's kept, there are ways to restore the structure of that uh, of the domes. Few people know it's a concrete building. It's not metal. It's not steel. It is concrete, and it was formed on the ground and raised into place. And the joints are welded together. Believe it or not. Uh, also, I'm, I'm blanking on the architect's name. I should know. Anyway. Uh, he has a patent on the way the, the dome is drained. And that drainage system comes starts from the very top and it weaves its way down to the bottom and to the to the ground. And people don't know that. But uh, it was never intended to rain inside that building. Whatever moisture occurs inside is uh, uh, there are three domes. One is the uh, arid, the other one is the um, tropic. And then there's a show dome. Well, the tropic one in the winter time that sweats. And so it's, and whether it's raining or whatever, a lot of that water tends to come down the, the glazing and it's supposed to be caught by these troughs. And these troughs meander all the way down to the ground. It's really cool. And um, he, handed, he handed me the patent paperwork for that. I said, you know, this should be in some archives in a museum, not in my possession. But that's one of the aspects of it. And I think we have technology. 
it's interesting about the science of concrete. Uh, when I was when I was taking my structures courses, I don't think we had um, a concrete design that exceeded ten thousand psi max, and it's all these chemicals and stuff in it to make it work like that. We have steel now. I mean, concrete now that's th two or three times that in strength, and that was unheard of when I was in school. So. Um, I'm getting around to the point where I'm saying that it's possible to restore that structure in my mind and and have it last for another 100 years and have it be uh, uh, one of the wonders of the world, so to speak, and, and, and keep Milwaukee on the map, Wisconsin on the map for that matter, because it's that great, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, so that was one example. Um, there are other ones. Uh, um, uh, we the uh, building that's out in uh, in the uh, uh, Milwaukee Medical Grounds. There's a, there's a um, a um, a building out there for um, that houses. Uh, people who have mental trauma. And uh, in that building was a, uh, a chapel, a gym. It was kind of like uh, an all-in-one type of facility for people to uh, get uh, medical help, uh, mental help. Um, that's, that's another building that uh, uh, was swept up in the um, in politics. And I, uh, in a way, I don't think it's, well, I believe that it's not fair that it's a political decision. I think it's a medical one that, may, that should be made by uh, people in the metal, medical field, not the political one. So, um, and my influence or, was more uh, parenthetical, that the asterisk at the bottom of the page, Mr. Wilson thinks that they, you know, it should be restored. That was, that was the end of it. But um, yeah, those are those are two cases in particular, and there are probably a number of other ones. Um, we were restoring uh, in, in the parks department uh, some of the uh, community facilities. They wanted to tear them down rather than keep them restored, uh, and. Uh, um, that was another another case where uh, I wanted our A and E group to have more influence than the Parks Department. They have landscape architects over there. We're architects. We do buildings, and they do landscapes. And there were uh, 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 times when uh, they our our influence over the architecture in the parks was downplayed on uh, in favor of what the landscape people wanted to do. So those those are three examples. Thank you. Thank you. Say goodbye from the mic here. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I just want to uh, thanks, thank our partners tonight, Wisconoma and AIA Wisconsin. Uh, I want to thank Walter Wilson for sharing his story with us tonight and his work. Thank you so much, Walter. And thanks to our audiences. Appreciate you coming out tonight. We do have an unusual kind of schedule with a week from now, the next right design lecture. So please come back. That is Ken Dolan, a racing architect who does uh, very right inspired work. If you're a fan of Frank Lloyd Wright, you may want to come back and check that out. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>